Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Slattery, and I'm a senior legal fellow at Pacific Legal Foundation and the co-host of our brand new podcast. It's called DIST, and it's all about dissenting opinions at the Supreme Court. On behalf of Pacific Legal Foundation and our partners at National Review Institute, welcome to our seventh annual Supreme Court preview. The Supreme Court term officially begins in just three days. The new term was already shaping up to be an interesting one, but then on Friday, September 18th, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, losing her battle to cancer. Now the court is front and center as we approach the presidential election in just a few weeks. There will be plenty of other events to analyze the pending Supreme Court confirmation. So as we've done in past years, today we're mostly going to stick to the cases before the Supreme Court, including a few that the court just announced this morning at 9.30 that it will hear this term. And boy, are there big ones coming up. The Affordable Care Act returns for a seventh time. There's an important separation of powers case involving the Federal Housing Finance Agency and several cases involving religious liberty and free speech. And of course, we'll dig into some just granted cases. We have an outstanding panel of experts to offer comments on the upcoming term. Moderating our discussion today is Ramesh Panuru. I'm sure he's well known to you, so I will keep his introduction very brief. Ramesh is a senior editor at National Review, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, and a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. With that, Ramesh, please take it away. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and thank you um, to National Review Institute and uh, our friends at the Pacific Legal Foundation for setting this up as we've been doing for several years now. It's always an extraordinarily informative event. It's worth it to me just to, uh, just to get the information uh, and take some notes. Um, this tends to be a very information packed and uh, analytically uh, dense in the right, in the good sense, um, discussion. So uh, we're gonna try to keep it moving along pretty briskly. I am going to start by introducing our first panelist, who is um, Jeff Rosen, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years. Um, Jeffrey Rosen is the president and chief executive officer of the National Constitution Center, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate the public about the US Constitution. It is located appropriately enough in Philadelphia. He's also a professor at the George Washington University Law School and a contributing editor of The Atlantic. Jeff is the author of six books, including most recently, Conversations with RBG, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on Life, Love, Liberty, and Law. And so Jeff, I, I would like to ask you to talk a little bit about the late justice uh, and then uh, to talk about uh, what is probably the most anticipated and maybe dreaded case uh, on the docket right now, which is the Affordable Care Act one. Thank you so much, Ramesh. It is wonderful to be with you and with such a, a distinguished group of panelists to talk about this really important Supreme Court term. And it is meaningful and significant to take a moment to remember Justice Ginsburg. Um, I, I, I had the honor of knowing her uh, serendipitously. We met in an elevator uh, three years ago when I was a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, we bonded over opera and we began a, a lifelong friendship that culminated in a series of conversations included in that book you mentioned. Uh, friends who are watching, I think it's so important uh, to remember Justice Ginsburg as she wanted to be remembered. And I want to just emphasize two really significant quotations that she gave to us uh, to remember her by. Um, first, she said, when asked how she wanted to be remembered, uh, she first said, as someone who used whatever talent she had to the very best of her ability to repair the tears in our society and to make the world a little better. And that inspiring and moving expression of her commitment to the unity of we the people, the court and the constitution was encapsulated in her friendship with Justice Scalia. They two bonded over opera and their love of music transcended their disagreements over the constitution. 
uh, because they also bonded over their commitment to the court as an institution. And I just also wanted to share um, something encapsulated in that quotation, which was her stunning, astonishing, unparalleled, remarkable work ethic. More than anyone I've ever had the privilege of knowing and will ever know, she used every moment of every day to focus on productive work and helping others. And she got that advice from her mother who told her to overcome unproductive emotions like anger, jealousy, and remorse because they are not productive. And she exercised her talents, her formidable talents to the best of her ability, which was extraordinary to transform the constitution into what she called a more embracing document, embracing not only the left out people uh, grudgingly, but with open arms, as she put it. And that made her the most influential advocate for gender equality of our time, and also the most influential advocate for constitutional change, one of the most significant advocates in American history. The other quotation I'll quickly read, and then I'll uh, uh, close uh, this remembrance, um, is a statement that she offered to the National Constitution Center uh, when we offered her the Liberty Medal. Um, the ceremony was broadcast the night before she passed. These were her words, which, which seem to have been her last public statement. Um, and uh, the paragraph is a few sentences, but because she chose words so carefully, I just hope that everyone will listen closely to each word because it's how she wanted to be remembered. She said, it was my great good fortune to have the opportunity to participate in a long effort to place equal citizenship stature for women on the basic human rights agenda. In that regard, I was scarcely an innovator. For generations, brave women and enlightened men in diverse nations pursued that goal, but they did so when society was not yet prepared to listen. She said, I was alive and a lawyer in the late 1960s and the decade commencing in 1970s. Conditions of life had so changed that audiences responded positively to pleas that society, men, women, and children, would be well served by removing artificial barriers, blocking women's engagement in many fields of human endeavor, from bar membership to bartending, policing, firefighting, piloting planes, even serving on juries, helping to explain what was wrong about the closed door era was enormously satisfying. Um, let's just all take a moment in memory of this great and historic advocate for constitutional quality and for the unity of we the people. May her memory be a blessing. Um, the Affordable Care Act case is indeed, Ramesh, as you said, one of the most closely watched of the term. I'm just going to describe the arguments in the uh, nonpartisan spirit of the National Constitution Center uh, and uh, let our friends who are listening um, evaluate them. The facts are, as we remember, uh, that in 2012, the Supreme Court upheld the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act against a constitutional challenge by saying that the penalty for not buying health insurance was a tax. And the court held that Congress had the power to impose that tax. In 2017, Congress amended the Affordable Care Act and set the penalty for not buying health insurance to zero. And it left the rest of the law in place. Texas and a bunch of other states uh, sued and they challenged the individual mandate. They said, because the penalty is zero, it can't be characterized as a tax and is therefore unconstitutional. Uh, a federal district court held, uh, agreed, it held that the individual mandate is now unconstitutional. And as, as a result, the entire Affordable Care Act is invalid because the individual mandate can't be severed from the rest of the act. So there are two important questions in the case. First, is the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act, which now has a penalty of zero for not buying health insurance, unconstitutional? And second, if the individual mandate is unconstitutional, is it severable from the remainder of the Affordable Care Act? I'll just briefly note the arguments that both sides make. Uh, in the brief for the petitioners, uh, California and other states say that uh, the mandate is sustainable early, either as a merely precatory provision or as a suspended exercise of the taxing power. And they say the contrary premise, it's, it's to say that when Congress zeroed it out, it no longer was a tax, rests on a premise that when Congress amended the law, it transformed the mandate into the very command that the Supreme Court had already held to be unconstitutional. 
and every relevant interpretive principle of California says confirms that Congress did no such thing. Uh, the uh, House of Representatives agrees. They also um, say that respondents lack our Article III standing, which may or may not be uh, relevant to the case. Um, and then, the, of course, the, the second central question is severability. And um, even if uh, the court concludes that the mandate itself, having been zeroed out, is uh, no longer taxed and is therefore unconstitutional, uh, the question is, can it be severed or does the entire act have to fall? And citing uh, previous precedents, including the court's uh, previous encounters with aspects of the Affordable Care Act, the defenders say that the law is certainly severable and absolutely Congress would have intended to sever an unconstitutional provision since they chose to amend the law rather than to repeal it. So that is the essence of the argument and back to you, Ramesh. Thank you for that, uh, that great reflection and uh, uh, explanation of uh, a case with a somewhat complicated history. Um, we're next going to hear from Canon Shanmugam who is a partner at Paul Weiss and the chair of the firm Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group. He has argued 28 cases before the Supreme Court, including five cases in the last two years. Most recently, he was lead counsel in the successful constitutional challenge to the structure of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And he has argued dozens of appeals in courts across the country, including all 13 US courts of appeals and numerous state courts. Prior to private practice, Cannon was assistant to the Solicitor General at the US Department of Justice. He's also been a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia and Judge J. Michael Ludig of the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. And I'm especially happy to have Cannon here on this panel um, because uh, he is a fellow Canton. Over to you, Cannon. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ramesh, and you saved the most important qualification for last. Um, it's great to be with everyone today, and thank you to um, the Pacific Legal Foundation and to Elizabeth and to the National Review Institute for having me and putting together what I'm sure will be um, a, a, a great program, as always. Um, I want to start by picking up where um, Jeff started, and that is with Justice Ginsburg. It's really hard um, to talk about the Supreme Court without talking about Justice Ginsburg because she left uh, an outsized um, impact on the work of the Supreme Court. And indeed, um, for me, and I think this is true for John as well, she was really um, virtually an ever present for us uh, in the cases that we argued uh, at the Supreme Court, having joined the bench um, even before I was a, a law clerk to Justice Scalia. And it was really in that capacity that I first met um, Justice Ginsburg. I met her 20 years ago when I was clerking for Justice Scalia. I got to witness firsthand her um, close relationship with uh, my former justice. And uh, I think um, everything that has been said about her um, in, that, in that regard is true. She was someone who really prized having friendships with people with whom she might professionally disagree. Uh, her friendship with Justice Scalia was perhaps um, the best example, but she was enormously well regarded by all of her colleagues, whatever their jurisprudence. And I think that she was someone who really believed very strongly in the importance of civil discourse and um, uh, separating the professional from the personal. And I think that those are values which sadly seem to be uh, rather endangered these days, but I think we can all look to her model uh, in that regard um, uh, 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 with, uh, with a great deal of approval. Uh, there are only a couple other things I would say about Justice Ginsburg. Lots of people have said lots of things about her jurisprudence, and I'm not gonna get into that today. But I think one thing I would say is that um, she was a really serious um, judge. She was sort of a judge's judge, as they say, uh, in that you know, I think in many ways she um, was somebody who, who almost cared more about the little cases than the big cases. Although she became the notorious RBG later in her career, um, there was nothing that floated her boat more than a good civil procedure case. And you knew as an advocate that um, even in the lowest profile cases, um, the sort of cases that I remember John once famously said were scarcely of interest even to the lawyers as they were arguing them, um, you knew that Justice Ginsburg would always bring her A game 
um, and she would always be extraordinarily well prepared. And she was very much a sort of legal technician. And as someone who uh, has been fortunate enough to practice before the court, I had a great deal of admiration for her for that reason. The other thing I would say about her was that she was just a person of incredible personal fortitude. And again, I had the chance to see that firsthand when I was a law clerk, because in the year that I uh, was clerking, she had the first of what would prove to be many bouts um, with cancer. And it was a very serious bout with colon cancer. And Justice Ginsburg during the year was getting both radiation treatment and chemotherapy. Um, and she didn't skip a beat. I think she didn't miss a single conference of the justices. She attended all of the oral arguments. And while she physically looked extraordinarily frail, um, she had just such an indomitable spirit. And you know, when you think about it, it's really remarkable that over the course of 20 years, she um, conquered cancer on numerous occasions until, um, uh, until the final round um, uh, uh, from which she ultimately passed. And so uh, you know, she was really a remarkable figure, obviously a trailblazer in the law, and I think that she will be very much missed uh, by the court. Uh, Ramesh, I don't know if um, you'd like me to go on and talk about both of the cases that I have on my uh, agenda, but if so, why don't I start with um, Collins versus uh, uh, Mnuchin, which is the case involving um, the um, Federal Housing Finance Agency that in some respects is a sequel to the case involving the CFPB that Ramesh mentioned in my introduction. And the facts of this case are uh, a little bit complicated, so bear with me. I'm going to try to simplify this to the extent that I can and then set out the legal issues. This involves something called the net worth sweep, which um, uh, sounds somewhat sinister, and in some respects, I think it probably is. Um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency was set up in 2008, and it was really set up at the height of the financial crisis to regulate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And um, everyone will have heard those names, but perhaps everyone won't know exactly what those two entities actually do. They are these sort of weird hybrid entities that on the one hand are um, publicly traded companies, but on the other hand are congressionally chartered. And they played um, a, a substantial role in the mortgage crisis of 2008, um, not in any bad sort of way, but because they were um, entities whose principal mission was really to purchase mortgages and then repackage them as securities and to sell them on the open market. And by the time of the financial crisis, Fannie and Freddie owned um, about half of the national uh, mortgage market. And um, uh, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, or FIFA, was really set up to sort of be the conservator of these two entities, which were obviously in financial distress as a result of all the defaulting mortgages. And FIFA was given very broad powers by Congress that were subject to relatively limited judicial review. Well, the Treasury proceeded to um, uh, 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 essentially infuse Fannie and Freddie with cash. They infused something like uh, $100, billion, uh, $100 billion of cash in return for the ability to receive um, dividends from Fannie and Freddie. Uh, but in 2012, um, the Treasury uh, decided that it wanted more. And so it entered into an agreement with FIFA to sweep hence the, the net worth sweep, any excess revenues that these two entities had into the treasury. And in so doing, this structure really operated to the detriment of existing shareholders who were um, uh, in the front of the line and ended up going to the back of the line as a result of this agreement. And this was the subject of uh, much litigation, including the case that came up to the Supreme Court um, that is now known as Collins. There are two parts of the case. I think the one that is somewhat more technical and perhaps less interesting is whether um, the shareholders essentially have the right to, shoot, to sue FIFA or whether their lawsuit is precluded either because they are not appropriate plaintiffs uh, or because um, they uh, simply can't challenge any actions that FIFA took in its role as a conservator. I think the more interesting part of the case is the constitutional part of the case to which Elizabeth alluded in her introduction, um, which involves, uh, again, two parts. First, whether FIFA is unconstitutionally structured, and second, if so, what to do about it. I think it's pretty uh, clear in the wake of the CFPB decision 
that FIFA is also unconstitutionally structured because it has a single director who is not removable at will by the president. And by limiting the president's removal power over an executive official, Congress arguably violated the separation of powers. Indeed, the challengers devote only two pages to that issue in their brief. So I think it's fair to say that they seem to think that it's not sophisticated. The harder question is whether it follows from that that FIFA's action should be invalidated. And I think there are some very interesting questions about the appropriate remedy for a separation of powers violation like this one. The Fifth Circuit in a divided end bank decision said that there was no such problem, uh, but uh, that will be, I think, the focus of much of the attention in the Supreme Court. And the other case I wanted to mention, and I think I can cover this one quite economically, um, is a case that go goes by the name of Uzweg Bunam versus Prashevsky, which has to be probably the highest Scrabble point value for the name of a Supreme Court case, perhaps in the history of that great institution. Um, and this was a case that started out as a free speech case. But the question before the Supreme Court is a somewhat more procedural one. It involves two students who were seeking to distribute religious liberty, uh, religious literature at a public uh, a college, a Georgia Gwinnett College in the state of Georgia. And they were actually stopped from doing so. They proceeded to apply for the equivalent of a permit to do so, got a permit to do so, and were stopped uh, again. And they immediately brought suit claiming a First Amendment violation. And in response to their suit, um, the uh, school actually dispensed with the permit requirement. The question in the case as it comes up to the Supreme Court is whether the students can nevertheless still proceed or whether or not the suit is moot. And the answer to that question depends on whether or not you can proceed with a lawsuit when all that you are seeking is nominal damages because everyone agrees that um, to the extent that they're seeking other forms of relief that that would be moot in light of the change of policy. Nominal damages are the ability to bring suit for uh, essentially a dollar. It's sort of the price is right uh, remedy uh, for uh, those of you who are fans of that great game show. Uh, and the question um, before the Supreme Court is whether or not, if you're whether if you're seeking just a dollar, you can proceed um, with the lawsuit where you're trying to vindicate an underlying constitutional interest. This is an issue that came up in a second amendment case that was before the court last year, albeit indirectly. And I'd say that there are comparatively few contexts in which a plaintiff truly doesn't have a claim for broader uh, compensatory or other damages. Um, but it's an issue that comes up uh, at least occasionally in the First Amendment context. And it'll be very interesting to see what the court ends up doing with this case. And so this may seem to be a case involving um, uh, uh, broader First Amendment questions. In fact, it involves constitutional questions along a somewhat different dimension. So with that, I'll hand it back to Ramesh. Thank you, Cannon, um, for that. Uh, uh, that was indeed a brisk tour through uh, through some complicated issues. Um, we're going to hear next from John Elwood, who's a partner at Arnold and Porter and head of the firm's appellate and Supreme Court practice. He's argued nine cases before the Supreme Court and appeared before most of the federal courts of appeals. He successfully argued cases across a broad cross section of subjects with particular experience in environmental law the False Claims Act, government contracting, and federal criminal law. He's a frequent contributor to SCOTUS blog, the premier Supreme Court blog. Although I have to put in a plug for bench memos at National Review Online if we're going to be uh, getting into that kind of competition. John previously served as an assistant to the US Solicitor General and a senior deputy in the Office of Legal Counsel at the US Department of Justice. He also clerked for Justice Anthony Kennedy and for Judge Daniel Mahoney on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Court, excuse me, Second Circuit. Um, so, John, please uh, uh, tell us about some more of the cases that are coming up at the Supreme Court. Great. Well, uh, I'd like to thank the Pacific Legal Foundation for having me today. This is always one of the premier Supreme Court previews, and hopefully, time to allow us to discuss the granted cases out of the Supreme Court's long conference, which I always appreciate. On a personal level, uh, Justice Ginsburg was such a presence in my legal career. Her tenure on the court overlaps with my own practice of the law almost perfectly. She was put on the bench when I was graduating from law school. And so last Saturday was literally the first day of my practice without her on the Supreme Court. She's only the 24th on the list of the longest serving justices, but I think she casts a far longer shadow because of her stature. 
Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that she was the Thurgood Marshall of women's rights. Uh, she was a legend before she went on the bench. And I think because of it, she spoke with extra authority. For example, her dissent in Lily Ledbetter versus Goodyear called on Congress to act. And in part, I think of because of who she was and her history, uh, they did so within two years. Some people criticized her for breaking the fourth wall with Congress, but her dissent became the law of the land fairly quickly. Uh, this also, you know, comes up in other ways, uh, you know, just like um, uh, old Chief Justice Rehnquist, you know, having lived so much of the law, she had a tremendous body of knowledge to draw on. And during the Bostick case, I think it was during the last year, the Title VII case, she was quizzing uh, uh, Solicitor General Noel Francisco during the argument, uh, and she was able to rattle off the names and facts from 1970s uh, circuit court decisions because she litigated them. Uh, and it's just tremendous, uh, you know, body of knowledge to draw on. As Jeff hinted, uh, Justice Ginsburg was a real force of nature. She had just incredible work ethic and drive. Uh, I joked back in 1989 that if there's ever a holiday named after her, instead of getting the day off, people have to put in a 12-hour day just like she routinely did. She routinely worked past 10 o'clock and sometimes even after midnight. Uh, and I think uh, above all else, I think she lived just a tremendous American life. She was not a child of privilege. She was a child from out by Avenue P in Brooklyn, um, not even close in Brooklyn. She was the child of an immigrant from, uh, from Odessa and a first generation American. I believe she graduated first in her class from Cornell and was one of only nine women in her class at Harvard during the 1950s. Um, I, but uh, you know, I think even though she was a very tiny woman in stature, uh, as Cannon said, she was indomitable and she's a great illustration of General Eisenhower's old maxim that what matters is not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. Um, but she was also very nurturing. And if you ever watched uh, arguments in the courtroom uh, during the bar admissions, virtually every other justice was just, you know, looking through their briefs or staring off into space. But she always made a point of beaming down on the new bar admittees like she was a proud grandmother. So uh, she was uh, really something, uh, quite a member of the court and uh, she will be missed. I have two cases to discuss today. One, a potential blockbuster and one kind of an also ran. The blockbuster, uh, potential blockbuster is Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. And it has not one, but two potentially blockbuster issues in it that the Supreme Court could resolve. It's gonna be argued the day after the election day at a time when not much else is likely to be happening. The bad news, or maybe the good news, depending on your point of view, is that it seems to me that the court is likely to decide neither of the blockbuster issues, although we'll at least get some hints about which way they'll ultimately go on them. Um, and that's because there are some factual issues that may provide the court an off-ramp that they strike me as they're likely to take. Now, big issue number one, what happens when you have a conflict between a non-discrimination requirement and a free exercise of religion claim? That was at the core of the Masterpiece Cake Shop case a few terms ago when the court confronted the issue of whether a Christian baker could be punished for refusing to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Uh, this is a great un unresolved dilemma of two lines of precedent that my former employer, Justice Kennedy, cared deeply about, two strands in his opinions that came to a head just as he was preparing to retire. Um, uh, first, the idea that the state has to allow room for people to live consistent with their religious beliefs. And secondly, his belief that gays and lesbians were entitled to equal treatment under the law. Now, o Obergefell, the opinion that recognized a, a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, clearly indicated that Kennedy at least thought that people with sincerely held religious objections would have some leeway to express and exercise that belief. Um, uh, but uh, I think it's an indication of what's likely to happen in this case that when in Masterpiece Cake Shop, the court took one of those off ramps that was available to it by getting rid of the case on a kind of a narrow factual issue. Big issue number two, which was so big that I could scarcely believe the court granted on the question, is whether the court should overrule employment division versus Smith. Now that is the decision, the Supreme Court decision that held that if you have a state law of general applicability, that's neutral in application, even if it burdens religious exercise, it doesn't trigger heightened scrutiny. It's one of Justice Scalia's most famous opinions. So if a state prohibits, as was the case there, uh, the use of peyote as a drug and your religion uses peyote as a sacrament, that prohibition isn't subject to strict scrutiny, tough dice. Uh, Justices Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh referred disparagingly to Smith in a dissent 
from denial of the uh, denial of cert in January of 2019, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, the kneeling coach case. Um, and so it, it suggests that there may be some people interested in uh, overruling that case. If it happens, I think that uh, religion has been, or religious liberty cases have been kind of on a tear for the past few years. Uh, and this would be really a watershed moment. But uh, I suspect, as I, as I hinted, that neither will come to pass because of messy life getting in the way. So finally, the actual facts of the case. The city of Philadelphia has long had a foster care placement program where they partner with organizations uh, to do the background checks and interviews and things of that sort. Some are religious, some are secular. Um, uh, one of the religious groups that has participated for, uh, in this program for years is the local Catholic Social Services Organization that's part of the Diocese of Philadelphia. Uh, they uh, basically aren't going to certify people who are in same-sex relationships. They'll do male-female mar married couples. They'll certify single-parent households, even if they're uh, gay or lesbians. Uh, but for obvious reasons of Catholic theology, they just don't want uh, to basically participate when it's a same-sex couple. Um, doesn't seem to have, I, I don't think there are any cases of anybody being turned down because I think people probably had enough sense not to uh, apply through them. Uh, it came, the, the whole thing came out of a newspaper article that caused uh, Philadelphia to pretty clearly uh, prohibit this as a matter of uh, kind of contracting. Um, uh, the issue here, though, is that for Smith to apply, the law has to be neutral in application and generally applicable. And the city allows all sorts of discretionary exceptions or generally allows discretionary exceptions. And it allows all sorts of groups to do certifications to pick out people only within their particular area of interest. Native Americans, Latino children, children of teenage mothers, uh, and the city has recognized that. In addition, as in Masterpiece Cake Shop, there are some statements uh, made by decision makers that suggest that they may be hostile to religion, which the court in, uh, in Masterpiece Cake Shop uses an excuse to kind of kick the case away and, and, go, uh, and, and, and send it back to the lower courts. So uh, we'll see what happens here, uh, but I think it's likely to, to, to fizzle out. Um, that brings me to my second case, which is Tanzan versus Tanvir. Now, um, uh, there's been a lot recently about official misconduct and holding people responsible for official misconduct. This is kind of a skinny wedge of that, which is essentially whether the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, which overruled Employment Division versus Smith as a matter of federal statute, permits suits seeking money damages against individual federal employees, that is federal officials in their personal capacities. Now, this case involves allegations that FBI agents sought to enlist practicing Muslims as informants in terrorism investigations. And when they refused, the allegation is that they put them on the no-fly no list. Uh, this was back when people thought it was a bad thing to be prevented from being on a metal tube with strangers. Um, respondents filed suit in federal court alleging that petitioners had put them on the, the no-fly list in retaliation uh, for the refusal to testify which was partly based on the religious uh, religious scruples. Um, and they, they sued in their personal capacity in relevant part. The Second Circuit held that RIFRA authorizes money awards against federal officials in their personal capacities. Um, they said basically, you know, the fact that the statute contains the phrase people acting under color of law um, uh, and both mentions officials and the government suggests that since officials acting in their official capacity are the government, that it must include personal capacity suits. And then it also held that appropriate relief includes monetary damages. Um, the government uh, argues that this is all bunk um, and that you know, basically a suit against people in, in their individual capacities and it is in no real sense a suit against the government or relief against the government. Uh, and that it shouldn't include uh, award of monetary damages. Although I have to point out though that Walter Dellinger when he was head of OLC opined that money damages in RIFRA were probably available. So that's uh, all the cases that I have that uh, uh, are, are already scheduled for argument. All right, great, thank you. So um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of our discussion. I'm gonna start out um, asking a few questions. But uh, I would also like to invite our online audience to submit questions of their own. Um, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button um, that you can use to submit questions. And then um, we will uh, be selecting some of the questions uh, 
or rather my, my colleague Elizabeth Slattery will be selecting some of the questions and, uh, and reading them. Um, but while we wait for you to uh, submit those questions, I have a, a few follow-ups I'd like to ask. Uh, and, and in particular, I wanna ask uh, Canon and John, if they had anything to add about the ACA case, since um, you know, obviously this is one with potentially huge ramifications for, for people and for the political landscape. Uh, and I wonder if, um, if either of you has any sense or thoughts on kind of what's likely to happen. Sure, well, I'm happy to go first and then to hand it over to John. I think it's pretty unlikely that the Supreme Court is going to invalidate the entire Affordable Care Act or even a broad swath of it in this case. Um, and that's largely because of a, an ob obscure legal principle known as, as severability, the principle that when a court invalidates a particular statutory provision, it should um, invalidate no more of the statute than is necessary in order to achieve that result. And while the court over the years has gone this way and that on um, the applicability of that doctrine, I think it's fair to say that we're in an era right now when where the court takes severability very seriously. And indeed that was on show in the CFPB case I argued earlier this year where the court rather than invalidating the CFPB in its entirety simply um, invalidated the specific constitutional provision, uh, statutory provision that was unconstitutional in limiting the president's power to remove the director of the CFPB and that left the rest of the statute functioning. And I think among the more conservative members of the court, both the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh are pretty stout proponents of that muscular view of severability. And so in light of that, it's hard to see how even with um, the potential confirmation of a Justice Barrett, there would be five votes to invalidate some broader section of the ACA, particularly because in this case, as Jeff pointed out, what Congress did was simply to repeal the very specific penalty for failing to have health insurance and Congress itself left the rest of the statute in place. And so at least under the court's existing severability jurisprudence, this seems like a pretty tough case for the proponents of a broader invalidation. I, I would just like to echo that, that uh, I agree 100% with what Cannon said, that this is a totally different issue than back when uh, the, uh, the individual mandate had teeth and people were talking, using phrases like death spiral, uh, that uh, without teeth in it, the, the, the act would go into a death spiral. And the only other thing I will add that uh, the two people who dissent the least are the people who believe most strongly in severability, Kavanaugh and the chief. Um, uh, you know, I, they, they, I, I can count both of their dissents on the fingers of one hand last term uh, without using my thumb. So uh, I, I, yeah, I think the smart money is that it's, it's not, it's not, that challenge isn't going to go very far in this court, but we will see. So um, I'd like to ask you all to comment, uh, if you could, on some of the recent grants, um, some of which uh, came out today, uh, and if there are any there that we should be keeping our eye on. Sounds great. Well, I'll just uh, jump in with the uh, Arizona voting case that the court voted today. Uh, this is uh, interesting and, and significant. Um, this involves a law that Arizona passed in 2016 that barred get out the vote operatives from submitting ballots and collecting them. And Republicans say it's uh, ballot harvesting and is ripe for fraud and Democrats say voters need it uh, to navigate the system. Um, and then there's another policy that says that if you choose to cast a ballot in person, you have to do it in your assigned precinct or otherwise the vote won't be counted. That's the out of precinct policy. And Arizona defends both of these policies and says they protect election integrity. The Ninth Circuit disagreed. It said that the rules have a discriminatory impact on Native American, Hispanic, and Black voters in violation of the Voting Rights Act. And it found that the criminalization of ballot collection, uh, in addition to having a discriminatory impact, was enacted with a discriminatory intent the opinion by Judge Fletcher 
um, in its description of the facts, uh, describes the Ninth Circuit's conclusion. Uh, it talks about um, the DNC's contention, that's the Democratic National uh, Committee's uh, contention that both uh, policies violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because they adversely and disparately affect Arizona's American Indian, Hispanic, and African American citizens, and also that uh, the policy violates uh, the 15th Amendment because it was enacted with discriminatory intent, as well as violating the First and 14th Amendments because they burden minorities' right to vote. So the uh, questions that the court granted cert on today are significant and uh, re rejecting the more, um, uh, I guess you'd say, tendentious uh, formulations offered by the parties on both sides. Here are the, here are the questions that the court granted cert on. First, whether Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act compels states to authorize, ah, forgive me, no, that, that was the more tendentious uh, version um, offered by uh, the state of Arizona. Actually, I'll finish reading it because it's interesting to compare, I think, the two statements. You'll have a sense of how this, the court chose to frame it. Arizona said the questions were whether Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act compels states to authorize any voting practice that will be used disproportionately by racial minorities, even if existing voting procedures are race neutral and offer all voters an equal opportunity to vote. And second, whether the Ninth Circuit correctly held that Arizona's ballot harvesting provision was tainted by discriminatory intent, even though the legislators were admit admittedly driven by partisan interests and supposedly unfounded concerns about voter fraud. So that's obviously the core of uh, Arizona's defense of the law, that uh, it, it, at least there was a mixed motive, including partisan uh, interests and the desire to stop voter fraud, and therefore that uh, discriminatory intent was not uh, predominant, uh, was not the predominant motive. The Supreme Court's formulation is this. Here are the two questions the court granted cert on. First, whether Arizona's out of precinct policy, which does not count provisional ballots cast in person on election day outside of the voters designated precinct violate section two of the Voting Rights Act. And second, whether Arizona's ballot collection law, which permits only certain persons, i.e. family and household members, caregivers, mail carriers and election officials to handle another person's completed early ballot violates section two of the Voting Rights Act or the 15th Amendment. This would, of course, uh, have potential significance uh, for the election in the event that the presidential election involved disputes about the discriminatory impact or motives of voting practices. Of course, this case will not be uh, argued, let alone decided before the election. So um, whatever its impact uh, will not affect uh, November 3rd. But um, the question of the status of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, how vibrant it remains after the Shelby County mm -hmm. case, which uh, constrained uh, enforcement under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, as well as whether East Section 2 itself is even constitutional in light of the questions raised about its constitutionality by Justice Thomas, among others, um, will be extremely significant. We haven't had the newer justices weigh in on the constitutionality or scope of Section 2, so that will be extremely interesting as well, and that is why it is such an interesting case. Thank you, um, Jeff. Did, uh, John, did you um, want to talk a little bit about the FCC case um, that uh, is, is coming up? Sure. This was uh, just granted this morning, uh, and it's a pretty interesting case. This is, involves a nearly two-decade dispute over the FCC's media ownership rules. Uh, to preserve competition and viewpoint diversity, the FCC has historically restricted the ability of broadcasters to own more than one outlet in a single market. Uh, Congress directed the FCC to review those ownership rules every four years. Beginning back in 2003, the FCC sought to relax those rules in light of changing market conditions, you know, uh, in part because people absorb so much of content not through broadcasters uh, and not even through traditional, you know, media channels, but through all sorts of things like YouTube and Twitter and things like that. Um, uh, and I think three different times, uh, the same Third Circuit panel uh, has vacated the rules. And in fact, uh, in the most recent opinion uh, begins, here we go again, or I guess they said, here we are again. Um, in the latest decision, the panel majority vacated the rules on the ground that the agency had not adequately analyzed the potential effect on female and minority owned ownership of broadcast stations. They said that the data just wasn't there. Um, so this is a very, very long-running uh, fight, 
and it could have a lot of impact if eventually if that's overruled and the FCC's new rules, which are a little bit laxer and permit more consolidation, uh, I think it could mean a lot for the face of uh, uh, broadcasting in the future. Canon, did you um, want to weigh in on any of the CERT grants? Um, I, uh, I thought I would just mention one other, um, and this is a case that John and I are both working on, and since uh, I uh, uh, never comment on my own cases, I'll simply describe the question in it. It's a case called BP versus um, City of Baltimore, and it involves a question of um, appellate procedure um, relating to cases where defendants seek to remove the cases from state court to federal court and where district courts send the cases back to state court on the ground that there is no federal jurisdiction. Um, those sorts of orders, so-called remand orders, are ordinarily not appealable in federal court, um, but there is an exception for cases where uh, one of the grounds for removal is that the uh, uh, defendants were acting at the direction of federal officers. And the question presented in this case is whether when that was one of the grounds for uh, removal uh, in an appeal, the defendants can obtain review of just that one ground of removal, or instead all of the grounds for removal that they have asserted. And this issue is coming up around the country in cases being brought against energy companies, including John's and my uh, clients in this case, seeking to hold them liable for uh, tort damages for uh, climate change. And the question in uh, the Baltimore case, as in many of these other cases around the country, is whether or not these cases belong in federal court or state court. I would just note a peculiarity about um, this case that may be of interest to those who are interested in Supreme Court procedure, and that is that obviously right now we have an eight justice Supreme Court. In fact, Justice Alito um, indicated in today's order that he was recused from this case. And so in fact, there were only seven justices who passed on the cert petition. Under the Supreme Court's rules, you still have to get four votes for the Supreme Court to grant review. So uh, we must have gotten at least four votes out of the seven uh, remaining justices. But um, uh, the good news for us is that the Supreme Court has a quorum as long as it has six justices. So we still have a, a little bit of a margin in terms of, of the court. But that case will, like the other cases that Jeff and John mentioned, uh, likely be argued um, uh, early next year. Is the uh, is the assumption that Justice Alito's recusal was driven by stock ownership or something of that nature, or do we know? Uh, I believe I, I believe that's the assumption, but a, as is the custom, there was no such indication in the order. All right, thank you uh, again, all of you. Um, and it looks like we have had some questions submitted, so I'm going to ask Elizabeth to uh, go through them and to ask our panelists. Thanks, Ramesh, and thanks to all the panelists for those great uh, comments. So we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, first one is about the Second Amendment. So the court last term dismissed the New York State rifle case, and then they declined to take up a whole host of Second Amendment cases at the end of the term. So do we think the court is just not interested in the Second Amendment right now? Any predictions? One assumption, a conventional uh, wisdom had been that uh, the court was not uh, sure of the vote of Chief Justice Roberts in Second Amendment cases um, and therefore uh, decided not to take them. Um, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch in particular have signaled their dissatisfaction with the renegation of the Second Amendment to what Justice Thomas calls a second class right and have filed uh, dissents from denial of cert in some cases, arguing that the court should have taken up those cases. Uh, and of course, the question of whether uh, the addition of uh, Justice Barrett, if, if she is confirmed, could change the calculus and lead to more Second Amendment cases being heard. Yeah, to follow up on that, uh, I built, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because there, there were four of them, but uh, Joan Biskupic wrote a series of four articles which uh, had some fairly insider scoop, uh, which is unusual, on the Supreme Court justices that indicated that uh, Chief Justice Roberts basically said thus far and no further, that he didn't have much interest in uh, doing anything further on uh, gun cases. So the addition of uh, Justice Barrett, if she's confirmed, 
uh, as a shooter of sporting clays uh, may, uh, may affect the calculus. Um, but I, I have to add, just because I picked it up during another Supreme Court preview, that um, uh, Joan Biskupic attributed her ability to get better scuttlebutt this year to the fact that everybody being on lockdown and so people were starved to talk to people. So uh, apparently people were more loose lipped after you know being held in solitary confinement for four months. All right, well, uh, John, we have a question specifically for you. This comes from uh, Jordan Rubin from Bloomberg Law, and he wants to know specifically about the Fulton case. Uh, since you mentioned your prediction is that it'll be decided on narrow factual grounds, um, why did the court grant cert, uh, particularly on the, the question of Smith? You know, uh, this is something I've kind of noticed again and again that uh, the, I, I think that they thought that there was something wrong with the idea that, you know, Catholic social services and a time when there's 30, a total of 30 organizations that are doing these sort of certifications for adoptions, that you have so many different ways to get covered by that, um, that they won't let, uh, you know, Catholic social services continue to do what they've done for a hundred years um, because, uh, you know, of their, their sincerely held religious beliefs when there's so many other outlets and so many other exceptions are made. Um, you know, I think there is some appetite for overruling Employment Division versus Smith. Um, there has been since the, since the day it was decided. Um, but I also sort of feel like uh, there is an instinct once these people have it, it's the, the Supreme Court is a little bit like the dog that catches the car and they're just, they're suddenly like, oh my God, we aren't gonna do this, are we? Um, this isn't always the case uh, because there are certain, you know, and sometimes they just have to work their way up to it. Um, you know, for example, the, uh, the, the series of cases involving union dues, you know, it, it, that was like watching it in slow motion. It took something like three tries before the Supreme Court finally ruled the way that we all knew that they were going to rule. So um, uh, it, it, it may be just that they kind of have to uh, work their way up to it. You know, the, the people say that Chief Justice Roberts is, is, is an incrementalist. And I think many of the justices in the center are incrementalists. So, uh, you know, it, it may take a while to get there. It may also take a while to decide it's really a good idea. So this is kind of a procedural question. Uh, for a long time, the court has been lobbied by outsiders to live stream their arguments. And after the uh, pandemic hit, the, the court made the decision to move to telephonic oral argument and to make that feed available to the public. So do you think the court can put the genie back in the bottle? I mean, I'm happy to take that one. Um, I don't think so, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I think the court could put the genie back in the bottle, but at least the experience from last spring when the court first started live streaming, I think was uniformly positive. Um, I don't think that there was any of the showboating that um, some were concerned about uh, as a result of the fact that the audio was being made available in real time. I think um, I, I, I sense that the court is much less concerned about the live streaming of audio than they would be with the live streaming of video. I don't think we're going to see the latter anytime soon. And there is a sense in which from a public access perspective, it, it is really a terrific thing to have the audio available in real time, particularly for people who um, have the temerity to live outside Washington and who can't therefore just jump in their car or jump on the subway as the rest of us uh, here can, uh, except for Jeff, and um, go down to the Supreme Court to watch oral arguments. And I saw some statistics that suggested that at its peak, there were around 80,000 people listening to the live stream. That's obviously many fewer people than probably downloaded the latest Taylor Swift album, but that's many more people than would be able to attend oral arguments in real time in a courtroom that seats around 350 or 400 people. So I certainly personally hope that the court continues with live streaming after it resumes its normal operations. And I think that there's a, a reasonably good chance that it will. So we have a couple of questions about cases that were held over from last term. Uh, Ford versus Bandemir, a, a case involving personal jurisdiction and the Oracle copyright case. Would anyone like to offer their comments on either case? 
What you said now has exhausted my knowledge of both cases. <laughs> uh, me too. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I'll, I'm happy to say a word about the Ford case, but I can't say anything about the the Google case because I represented uh, one of the parties at an earlier stage of that case. You know, I think the Ford case is the latest case um, to come to the court involving personal jurisdiction. It's actually a pair of cases, and this may seem like um, the sort of issue that makes jurisdiction over remand orders seem sexy by comparison. But personal jurisdiction is the notion that a court has to have jurisdiction not only over the subject matter of the claims, they have to be federal claims rather than state claims if you're in federal court, but also over the parties. And so a court in uh, Alaska ordinarily does not have the ability um, to hear a case involving a defendant from Wyoming. And where you're dealing with corporate um, defendants, there are a whole set of rules that apply to determine what states those defendants are uh, 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 resident of and under what circumstances those defendants can be hailed into a state, uh, a, a court from another state. And those rules apply equally in state court uh, as they do in federal court. And so these two cases basically involve um, people who um, I, I believe suffered injuries and car accidents in states um, that were, you know, not the states where the particular cars were sold and certainly not where the cars were manufactured. And the question is whether there, are juris there is jurisdiction in those states. And I would say that a sort of broad array of justices on the court have been progressively scaling back the rules for uh, when um, uh, uh, particular states have jurisdiction over corporate defendants. And certainly my going in expectation um, is that the court will continue to do that in these two Ford cases with the effect that when you, it comes to suing corporate defendants, plaintiffs often effectively have to go to the home states of those corporate um, defendants in order to be able to sue. That's the general trajectory of the court's uh, case law. And I could get into the differences between specific and general personal jurisdiction, but this might feel too much like a law school civil procedure class if I did that. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Cannon. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. So a lot was written at the end of the last term about how it is finally, truly the John Roberts court. So do you think this means we'll see a lot of unanimous or near unanimous uh, rulings in the future? Well, the John Roberts court didn't necessarily mean unanimity, but it did mean that the chief would uh, put institutional legitimacy above all and would attempt to forge uh, narrow unanimous opinions as he, or nearly so, as he so successfully did in the subpoena cases. He would occasionally join uh, the liberals when he thought that the institutional legitimacy of the court uh, re required it. Uh, and um, that's why last term he was widely viewed as the most influential chief since Charles Evans Hughes in 1937. If Justice Barrett is confirmed, that of course will change that dynamic significantly and his ability to play that role uh, will change as Justice Kavanaugh becomes the medium vote. Nevertheless, I'll, I'll just close by noting that the obvious but crucially important uh, point that the court's uh, legitimacy is uh, crucially important to all the justices in this extraordinarily fragile time for the United States of America. And those who predict, uh, for example, and I saw a question about this in the Q&A box, uh, a, a partisan divided decision in an election related case. I, uh, I don't share that a prediction. I would imagine that all of the justices, uh, whether or not Justice Barrett is confirmed would, would, would do their best, especially in election cases, either to avoid um, weighing in or to do so in a way that was unanimous and really so rather than uh, divided along pretty lines. I will uh, just observe that uh, I, I think last term, uh, the two biggest categories were essentially unanimous cases and then five, four or five, three decisions, uh, which again, not to beat a dead horse, uh, I wondered if the, uh, the, the closely divided cases are a reflection of the fact that there's no in-person hobnobbing going on, that you can't just walk down the halls and try to you know, hash something out with your colleagues um, uh, and whether that will continue in the future. Uh, but I will be interested to see, uh, you know, 
uh, I, I'm proud to say that I gave uh, uh, Amy Van Coney her first job out of the Scalia clerkship. We hired her at Miller Cassidy, my old firm. Um, and we taught a course together at GW. But, you know, I don't have a good sense whether, uh, you know, she's going to be one of these kind of characters who's more like Kagan and uh, Breyer and Kavanaugh, where they're, they're trying to work together to, you know, find common ground or whether she's going to be more, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, her former employer, Antonin Scalia. And, you know, this is my view. And, you know, if you don't like it, I'll write a dissent. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, famously, and I'd be interested to know if, if Jeff knows where this came from. Supposedly, Justice White said with each new addition, with each new justice, it's a whole new court. I've mm -hmm. never been able to find out where that's actually written down. It just repeats from mouth to mouth. But uh, it, it certainly does seem to be true. Uh, and maybe one of those facts is too good to check. We'll put the Constitution Center's crack content team on it and try to find the source. But I've read that too, and it's, as you say, it's profoundly true. All right, well, I think that uh, everybody uh, in the audience, hopefully, will agree with me that this has been a terrific discussion, very informative uh, and reflective. Um, thanks again to the Pacific Legal Foundation for working with the National Review Institute to put it together. And thank all of you, thank the panelists for uh, participating and lending their insights and their time, and thank all of you for watching it as well. And uh, until next year, um, I'll have to say farewell. Farewell. Hey,